I'm told I have to position it just there so that you can be reminded of it for the rest of my half an hour talk. Oh, was it half an hour? Sorry, no. Um, yeah, so this is a fantastic evening, and I just really feel incredibly privileged to be standing here in front of you, um, knowing that uh, last year's recipient was Paul Polman, who had spent a huge amount of time raising the flag for corporate sustainability in an inc incredibly important way. And it is uh, really special, Luke, to be honored in this way, and I, I thank you very sincerely indeed. Um, I've got the message about prisoners of hope. I hope by the end of my few minutes that I can persuade you all to think of yourself as emancipated champions of hope rather than prisoners, because I'd hate anybody to think they were being crushed by the bars of hopefulness that surrounds them. It's not a brilliant image, I have to say. But let's all be emancipated champions. And actually, I've sort of committed myself to this for, for 2020. I am working on my own special personalized hypothesis for 2020, which is that 2020 is one of those extraordinarily rare inflection points in the history of humankind. So not just in the world of corporate sustainability, not just in the UK, but in the history of humankind. And that is asking a lot of 2020, I can tell you, for reasons that most of you here will well understand. But I love the fact that there are now these incredibly exciting converging elements in our lives that give us some prospect of authentic hope. There's tons of false hope out there, you understand, but authentic hope, which really could change things in an astonishingly short period of time. And I can go to lots of places around that depending on what my mood is at any one point. I'm still massively excited by what is happening in the world of technology. It is extraordinary to look at how quickly new technology is beginning to transform markets all around the world at a speed that most people still can't quite get their heads around. I still meet lots of people who actually don't understand that we've just lived through the first decade of the solar revolution that will shape the destinies of every single human being on this planet for the rest of time. Most people still don't even get that. So there's tons of stuff about technology. Most of that technology is about decarbonizing the economy. I want to put in front of you tonight another reason to be equally hopeful, which is recarbonizing the planet. So for all we need to stop putting CO2 emissions and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, so we have got to work unbelievably hard to get billions of tons of carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere by recarbonizing the earth, our forests, soils, wetlands, peat box, mangrove swamps, kelp forests, all the rest of it, an extraordinary portfolio of solutions which is becoming more and more exciting. Add to that last critical ingredient on top of the technology, on top of the science, which is now pretty much irrefutable, is the power of what young people have brought to bear on this agenda. I don't know about the rest of you, but for me, 2019 was characterized in very large measure by this sense of the sheer energy of young people suddenly emerging into this agenda in a way that very few people thought was likely to happen. A symbolic representation of this, of course, moving from that single person, Greta Thunberg, sitting outside the Swedish parliament with her homemade sign, school strike for the climate, all the way through to the end of 2019, seven million young people on the streets of 106 different cities around the world. That is the fastest ever social, progressive social movement the world has ever seen, from one, power of one, to seven million in slightly less than a year. And don't think it's gonna stop at seven million, because it absolutely isn't. Now I know Greta Thunberg does not want us to be hopeful because she doesn't think that's gonna make much difference. But we sure as hell need the hope that she and others allow us to feel about this. It's like a kind of an injection of high-powered energy into our anemic veins to remind us what we really should have been doing for the last 30 or 40 years and quite honestly haven't been doing. The one downside of a Lifetime Achievement Award, Luke, is that you have to think about your life. That's a little bit... <clears throat> 
seriously upsetting, and happily the constraint on the time available to me means that I can't possibly do that. But I can reflect a tiny bit on the last 25 years, half my life as a green activist, a bit more than 40 years, but anyway, what the hell. Um, and that goes back to the time after, just after the Earth Summit in 1992 when I was uh, involved in setting up both Forum for the Future, which is the organization I'm still primarily involved in, and indeed the Prince of Wales's business and sustainability program. And this is the opportunity for me, quite honestly, sitting, standing here, staring out at an uh, astonishing uh, audience like this. This is my moment to pay tribute to the thousands of sustainability professionals who have made it possible for people around the world to see the private sector, to see business as a major substantive contributor to a more sustainable world. It is an astonishing thing. For those of you who can remember, and you go back to 1992, <laughs> if you'd said anything like that in 1992, you would have been rapidly consigned to a prison, that's for sure, and it would not have been a hopeful prison. But in the intervening years, 25 more years, this has been an incredible, gradual, but incredible increase in capability, in contribution, in inspiration, in leadership coming from the business community. And I do want to pay tribute to that because it's very easy to be very cynical, at least skeptical, about what that all amounts to. The dark arts of what I call targetry, where people seem to be more obsessed with setting targets than actually doing anything about making a contribution towards that target. And we are, at the moment, full of a world that is expert in targetry but not so good at delivery. In that world, it is not difficult to be cynical. But we really can't afford to be cynical about the contribution that business needs to make now. Business has earned its place at the high table. It's done so very often against the grain of the way the global economy operates, against the grain interestingly, of capitalism itself, which finds it extremely difficult to understand the importance of generating long-term sustainable outcomes rather than short-term profit maximization. 2020, big year for all of us, big year for business. I do hope that we can dispel forever one particularly pernicious and persistent illusion that lurks out there which is that somehow the private sector, working more and more collaboratively with civil society, NGOs, community groups, and so on, can somehow sort it out between them. Trust me, this is arrant nonsense. To create a sustainable world for 9 billion people now, and 7.7 uh, .7 billion now, 9 billion by 2050, 11 billion by 2100, this cannot be done without the consistent, smart intervention of government at every level. And I do not mean small government of the kind that neoliberal zealous ideologues have sought to achieve for the last 40 years. I mean big government. Big government as in the interventions that have to be made about regulation. Big government as in decisions that have to be made about fiscal policy. Big government, as in the ways in which we think of working collaboratively to create these sustainable outcomes for the whole of humankind. There's not going to be anything small about this governmental contribution. So the challenge for business tonight, and for all of you as sustainability professionals, is what is the voice of business going to say in this space? If you're simply going to go along with the kind of ideological orthodoxies that have dominated the last 30 years, I advise you to keep quiet. If you're going to acknowledge that we have to do this as a combination of forces between government, the private sector, and civil society, and you want your voice to be heard about that, you will speak up, for instance, on behalf of intelligent, smart regulation, fantastic, because that's what leadership is going to look like throughout the rest of this particular decade. So this is a big moment for all of us, whether we come from a civil society background, a business background, or even from a government background, although you will notice that I have spared you any of the kind of horror story that I could have laid before you tonight by um, expatiating on the horrors of what government has failed to do 
for the last umpteen decades. This is an evening of celebration. We don't have to worry too much about government. They're not hugely represented here this evening. They certainly aren't lining up for many awards, in my opinion, and that's probably an inevitable recognition of where we've been for the last uh, 30 years. But um, I look forward, Luke, to future award ceremonies where, who knows, we may actually have some politicians here who've earned their place at this table. In the meantime, I wish you all the very best, a completely happy evening, and uh, look forward to chatting to some of you as um, emancipated champions of hope. Thank you.